Hello everyone, I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library, and I have a great story to tell you. Tonight we will embark on a long, long journey and explore the earlier ages of our planet. I'm going to tell you about dinosaurs in general. We'll talk about the definition of what a dinosaur is and what it is not. And I will also tell you about the history of paleontology, the study of fossils, the evolution of species, and what we know about particular types or species of dinosaurs. For the most part, the information I'm going to share with you tonight is based only on theories and the understanding of the ancient ages of our world. The theories about this are in constant evolution, so they should be taken as a work in progress, as a state of knowledge that could be altered or even changed in the future. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This does help support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume to the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the description and also pinned in the first comment. In the same place, you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Music, and Apple Podcasts. But before we begin, assume a comfortable position. Take a long, deep, relaxing breath. And when you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders, your neck. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too. And allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. Long before our species even existed, Imagine you are flying above Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period. Long before the Jurassic, all the land mass on Earth had gathered into a single giant continent, Pangaea, a supercontinent that existed between 280 and 230 million years ago. It broke up during the Jurassic due to plate tectonics and its northern half, Laurentia, broke again into North America and Eurasia as a rift that became the Atlantic Ocean opened between them. The other half in the south, a continent called Gondwana, also broke up later and its split made Africa, South America, India, and Australia. But seen from above, the Earth's continents looked nothing like they do today. The climate was also different. It was warmer and more humid. Like in subtropical regions nowadays, the oceans contained abundant and diverse life. At the top of the food chains were the long-necked plesiosaurs. There were also sharks and giant marine crocodiles, and in many of the new seas that appeared with fractioning of Pangaea, there was an abundance of coral reefs, sponges, mollusks, ammonites, or squid-like animals, and who ruled their lands. The largest land creatures to ever live on the surface 
dinosaurs. There were small species of dinosaurs just a foot long. There were medium-sized species. And then there were giants, like Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, or Tyrannosaurus. These species did not live all at the same time. They didn't live everywhere either. Some of them may never have been able to meet because they were too far apart. Just like an Indian tiger and the North American grizzly could never meet in nature today. But everywhere on the planet and for dozens of millions of years, dinosaurs thrived. But what is and what is not a dinosaur? There is a general definition of the term, a general understanding in common language. That would tend to include all reptile-like creatures that lived in ancient periods on our planet. This definition appeared in the 19th century with the first discoveries of dinosaur fossils. And it includes creatures that are not dinosaurs according to paleontologists today. For example, there are species sometimes mistaken for dinosaurs that appeared and went extinct before the dinosaurs. An example is Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon lived 290 to 270 million years ago. This is twice as far in the past as the Jurassic period relative to us. It was not a dinosaur, even though it looked like one. It had a large spine sail on its back that probably served either to regulate its temperature or was used in courtship display and to threaten rivals or both. But Dimetrodon was not a reptile. It was actually closer to mammals than modern reptiles, and it went extinct 40 million years before the very first dinosaurs. Another group of animals commonly mistaken for dinosaurs is pterosaurs. They belong to a group called pterosauria that went extinct and they are not related to modern birds in any way. And finally, sea reptiles like Plesiosaurus or Mosasaurus are not dinosaurs either. So what would be the definition of a dinosaur? Whatever the size, what dinosaurs have in common is that they belong to the same branch of the evolutionary tree. They belong to the same clade. So what is a clade? It is a way in biology of classifying organisms based on their relation to a common ancestor. Imagine a tree of life with all species. The clade is a branch of this tree. It starts with a species or a population and includes all its lineal descendants, other organisms that evolved from it. This is what dinosaurs have in common, an ancestor. Other creatures that may have looked like them or lived during the same period are not classified as dinosaurs because they belong to another branch. Clades are nested. They can contain smaller clades, as the evolution of species leads to significant divergences in the tree of life. In the case of dinosaurs, there are two main branches to the clade. Fossil records indicate that during the late Jurassic period, the lineage of dinosaurs with feathers developed and formed a branch of evolution called avian dinosaurs, 
also known as birds. This branch survived the extinction of the other branch, the non-avian dinosaurs, and it thrives until our time. So, in this sense, the clade of dinosaurs is still alive and well. They are around us even though the non-avian dinosaurs are no more. But for tonight, we're going to focus on non-avian dinosaurs. So we will leave the birds aside for now. This approach, in relation to the classification of species, has revolutionized biology in the past 50 years. It has now become mainstream within the scientific community and clashes a bit with the previous traditional classification of species that was in use in previous centuries. Some terms are still used in everyday language that no longer make much sense in biology and zoology. Historically, organisms were classified based on their morphological similarities. This is how groups like reptiles were named, for example. However, sometimes two animals sharing apparently similar morphologies can be quite far apart in the evolutionary tree. They end up looking alike out of efficiency because this morphology works within their environment in a phenomenon called convergent evolution. But based on their lineage, animals called reptiles can have very different ancestors. For example, a crocodile or an alligator is more closely related to a bird than to a lizard. We know this through the study of DNA fossil records, the study of bones, and the morphology of scales. If we take a look at the enlarged family of dinosaurs and search for the group to which their clade belongs, we need to move a few million years back in time, around 250 million years ago. Dinosaurs are part of a larger group, a larger clade, called archosaurs which includes not only non-avian and avian dinosaurs, but also their descendants. It also includes crocodilians and pterosaurs, the flying animals that lived during the same period as dinosaurs. Although not part of the same family, pterosaurs are close relatives. The classification in clades looks a bit more complicated and sometimes not very intuitive for non-biologists because the classification of a particular species in a clade requires detailed analysis of its remains, morphology, and other comparable organisms. It is a convention based on research argumentation, and nowadays complex algorithms. This approach, based on evolution, has allowed various breakthroughs in the understanding of life forms. The classification of birds and the lineage of dinosaurs is one. But to make a quick digression, there are other examples. Another one revealed by molecular biology and genetics is the understanding that all sorts of fungi, including yeasts, molds, or mushrooms, are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. The traditional distinction between fauna and flora, between animals and plants, is questioned by the existence of fungi. They are not animals because, among other things, they cannot move. They are not plants either. They share characteristics with animals, such as the way they feed. They dissolve molecules with digestive enzymes. 
so they are somewhere in between plants and animals. They have their own kingdom. And this was confirmed by the discovery that all fungi share a common ancestor and are parts of the same clade, distinct from other life forms. But let's return to non-avian dinosaurs. The clade appeared between 243 and 233 million years ago, during a period called the Triassic. It is known that some periods in Earth's history have been defined by extinction events. Records show a pattern of repetition throughout the history of our planet. Life tended to develop and diversify for periods lasting millions of years until dramatic shifts in conditions occurred. These shifts could result from climatic changes or external events, such as massive asteroid impact. The theories regarding these events remain a topic of discussion, suggesting that they may have been caused by a single event or a combination of various factors. Regardless, these events led to a rapid reduction in species diversity. It is important to note that quick or rapid in this context does not mean instantaneous. These extinction events could have spanned several million years, but they appear quick because the time intervals between them are longer, especially considering the vast time scale of the past. So, the so-called Triassic period covers about 50 million years. From 250 to 200 million years ago, this is when the first dinosaurs walked on the continent Pangaea, before it broke up into Laurentia and Gondwana. It is believed that most of Pangaea had a continental climate because of its size which limited the moderating effect of the global ocean surrounding it. This meant hot summers and cold winters. On average, the planet was warmer than today, and the atmosphere was less rich in oxygen, about 80% of current levels. The oceans were dominated by ichthyosaurus and the first plesiosaurs, which are two orders of marine reptiles. The land mass was populated by many reptiles, too. Some of them were herbivores, such as the rhynchosaurs. Others were predators like the phytosaur. These ones look like modern crocodiles, even though they were not. There were other archosaurs, like rasutians, that were also animals related to mammals, such as the cynodonts, which may have had fur as a means of temperature regulation, and among them appeared the first dinosaurs. But they had humble beginnings in the Triassic. They were only three to six feet long. That's one or two meters. And they hunted small prey in the shadow of larger predators. One of the first known dinosaurs is called Coelophysis. Its remains were found in what is now the southwestern United States and also in South Africa. Coelophysis was relatively small and slender, a carnivore. The largest specimens discovered were about nine feet long, from the head to the tip of the tail. Its weight did not exceed 20 kilograms, or about 40 pounds. The shape of the skull suggested that it had large, forward-facing eyes that gave it a good perception of depth. It is believed to have hunted during the day and hidden at night under the cover of forests. 
Before Silophyses, there was an even smaller dinosaur called Eoraptor. It could have been the size of a medium-sized dog and weighed up to 20 pounds. It was probably a fast runner and a hunter, searching for small mammals or insects. It is believed that Eoraptor could be or resemble the common ancestor of all dinosaurs. Early dinosaurs probably had to hide from bigger and more successful predators. But contrary to them, and maybe because they were not at the top of the food chain, they avoided extinction. Even before the end of the Triassic, larger carnivores and herbivores went extinct, which left more room for dinosaurs in the ecosystems. The first few lines of dinosaurs diversified before the end of the Triassic, and then came another mass extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic extinction, which occurred 201 million years ago. This event happened very quickly, in less than 10,000 years, just before the continent Pangaea started to break into smaller pieces. This mass extinction was not as drastic as the previous one that started the Triassic period. It is estimated that the Permian-Triassic extinction saw the disappearance of 96% of marine species, 70% of terrestrial vertebrates. This time during the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, only around 30% of marine species and 40% of terrestrial species disappeared. The reasons for this extinction are still debated. They could include a rapid climate change that may have reached a tipping point or an asteroid impact, but no large enough crater has been found from the same period. However, the asteroid could have hit a place that was later submerged, or it could have fallen into the ocean. It could also be due to a massive volcanism. The extinction happened about the time when Pangaea was separating, and volcanoes could have released a huge amount of gases that could have changed the climate, either warming or cooling it. Either way, the extinction happened and the dinosaurs came out on top in the reorganization of land ecosystems. The first few lines of the dinosaurs' extinction marked a significant turning point. However, after the commencement of the Jurassic period approximately 200 million years ago, their descendants emerged and gradually occupied the primary ecological niche. This remarkable evolutionary development led to a diverse array of species taking on crucial roles within their respective ecosystems. The Jurassic was a golden age for large herbivore dinosaurs that grew in size dramatically. These are known as the sauropods. An example of sauropods is Brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus lived in what is North America today. During the late Jurassic, around 154, 153 million years ago, it is estimated to have been between 60 and 70 feet long for adults and have weighed 30 to 60 tons. Distinctive features of sauropods include their very long neck, their small skull, and their huge size. There are other species related to Brachiosaurus, which have been discovered around the world. The small difference is probably due to the separation of the landmass during the Jurassic which caused regional divergences between groups that could no longer be in contact. With this anatomy, brachiosaurs and other sauropods are considered high browsers, 
They probably ate leaves from trees, dropping vegetation as high as 30 feet. For a long time, it was believed that large sauropods could not regulate their temperature. Because of their similarities with other cold-blooded reptiles and their size, warming the entire system would have required a lot of energy. However, recent research suggests that they were warm-blooded and could be more active than previously believed. Some sauropods could be much larger than brachiosaurs and may have been the largest land animal to ever exist, as far as we know. Bigger sauropods appeared long after the Jurassic period, well after brachiosaurus. During the following period, the Cretaceous, the largest known dinosaur belonged to a group called Titanosaurs. Their fossil remains were discovered in the south of South America. There are species called Patagotitan or Argentosaurus, which would have been 120 feet long, with a weight of more than 70 tons. This is twice as big as Brachiosaurus. We can never be sure that our knowledge of dinosaur species is exhaustive. It is very certainly not. About a thousand different species have been identified, but this is not much for a group that existed for a long time. Very few fossilized remains, and even fewer remains accessible millions of years later. We may have a reasonably good knowledge of larger dinosaurs because their remains are big and easier to find and date. However, there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands, of dinosaur species that remain undiscovered. Our knowledge of the ecosystem remains fragmented. Alongside sauropods, other smaller herbivores thrived during the Jurassic because they were not protected from predators by their sides like sauropods. They developed other means of protection, including armor. A group contemporary to Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus is Stegosauria. This group developed tail spikes, very probably as defensive weapons, and as their size increased and made them less and less able to run from a threat, their armor increased in size and thickness, and it was also harder. Stegosauria had arrays of spikes and blades running along their backs and their tails too. Stegosauria is a large group that diversified a lot in shape and size, depending on the regions where they lived around the world. Contrary to early dinosaurs that walked on two legs, they couldn't stand and stayed on four limbs. Their heads became comparatively small, and they stayed low, close to the ground indicating that they specialized in collecting vegetation on the ground, or just a bit above. They probably never competed with sauropods for food. The scoots on their back were made of bone. However, they were not attached to the skeleton. It is the skin that's ossified to create them, as the young specimen grew up. And another very famous type armored herbivore dinosaur is a Triceratops. But there is no chance it could have met a Stegosaurus. Triceratops appeared at the end of the Age of Dinosaurs, around 68 million years ago. As far as we know, Stegosaurus went extinct 60 million years prior to the appearance of Triceratops because non-avian dinosaurs did not disappear with the Jurassic. 
they continued to thrive during the following era, the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous ended with another massive extinction 66 million years ago. Actually, many dinosaurs associated with the word Jurassic never existed during this period. Apart from Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus is another example of this. It is from the late Cretaceous, and it could not have met earlier species. But it could have fought Triceratops. They are from the same period, and their remains were both found in North America. Triceratops literally means three-horned face. It had a large four-legged body. It was one of the biggest herbivores living in the late Cretaceous, with a weight of about 12 tons when adult. The characteristic horns have long been seen or theorized as defensive weapons, but this remains controversial. Could have also have been means of identification and dominance display. As for the antlers and horns of modern species, we don't know. Triceratops was probably preyed upon by Tyrannosaurus, arguably the most popular and famous dinosaur. Tyrannosaurus is the name of a group, with the most famous being Tyrannosaurus rex, or T. rex for short. It is well known through fossils found in various rock formations in North America. Contrary to herbivorous dinosaurs that tended to evolve towards smaller heads, Tyrannosaurus had a very big head with a massive skull, balanced by a long and heavy tail. Its four limbs were short, but relatively strong for their size. Tyrannosaurus rex is believed to have the strongest bite force among all terrestrial animals ever. Other carnivorous dinosaurs could compete in size or even exceed it, but they had disappeared when the age of Tyrannosaurus began. It was by far the largest carnivore in its environment. Its lifestyle is hypothetical, but given its morphology and diet, it appears likely that it was an apex predator that preyed upon herbivorous dinosaurs, including maybe the largest sauropods, when they were young or too old to defend themselves. However, it could also have been a scavenger. Most paleontologists today admit that it was a bit of both, probably. Before Tyrannosaurus, other large carnivorous dinosaurs existed, and they had a rather small appearance. For example, Allosaurus, which was at the top of the food chain 80 million years before Tyrannosaurus could have battled with a Stegosaurus during the Jurassic period. Comparable predators, but smaller and probably quicker, also existed. For example, there was a group called Dinonychus at the beginning of the Crustaceous. These ones are famous under their name Velociraptors because of the Jurassic Park movies. But Velociraptors in the real world were much smaller than that. They were feathered dinosaurs, and they were about the size of a big turkey, very far from the velociraptors in the movies, which are recreations using the morphology from one species and the name from another species that did not live at the same time. As I mentioned before, some dinosaurs were feathered, but unless feathers have been fossilized, which rarely happens, it is difficult to know which ones. It is also impossible to know what color they were. They are often presented in shades of brown or green, or they may be gray, 
due to the comparison with modern reptiles and the history of their discovery. Since the first discoveries of fossilized remains of dinosaurs during the 19th century, the understanding of dinosaurs and theories about them have changed dramatically. Paleontology, which is a scientific study of life that existed prior to the start of our epoch, developed mainly in the 19th century. This science itself has also changed a lot since then, with contributions from many other branches of science and techniques, such as chemistry, biology, and engineering. In the past two centuries, paleontologists have been able to elaborate on hypotheses about the evolutionary history of life almost all the way back to when Earth began to support life. The study of dinosaurs is just one aspect of paleontology. Even though it's often the most visible one, there are many others. Dinosaur fossils were known long ago, even before paleontology became a recognized field. Some had been discovered in China hundreds of years ago where they were documented as dragon bones, leading people to believe in the existence of dragons. In Europe, these fossils were initially thought to be remains of giants or biblical creatures. One of the first groups of dinosaurs to be identified was Iguanodon in 1822 in England. From there, fossilized skeletons started to be reconstructed, and those who collected and studied these fossils realized they resembled ancient giant lizards that had left traces in the past. This growing interest in their study led to the coining of the term dinosaur in 1942. The first discovery and identification of a dinosaur in America happened a bit later in 1858. It's important because it revealed that the creature walked on two feet, and this was a revolutionary discovery. Until this point, dinosaurs were thought to walk on four feet, like lizards. This discovery sparked the first wave of a real dinosaur mania in the United States at the end of the 19th century. There was a rush to discover new fossils and even an episode called The Bone Walls Between Two Paleontologists on how to outdo each other. They resorted to bribery, theft, and even the destruction of bones and attacks on each other's reputation to try to get rid of the competition. They would even use dynamite to unearth bones quicker. They both ended financially and socially ruined by their rivalry, and they also destroyed valuable remains along the way. But this bone war led to the discovery of many new species of dinosaurs and to new sites where fossils could be collected. Sites for dinosaur remains can be found on all continents, but apart from North America and Europe, where many early discoveries took place. Hot sites in recent decades have been China and South America, especially Argentina. The dominant competition of dinosaurs in the 19th century, based on the observation of modern reptiles and given the size of the remains, was that dinosaurs were very slow and very heavy animals. They would have been cold-blooded like lizards, but with such a big size, their metabolism would have been very slow. This conception changed starting in the 1970s when it appeared that active predators may have been warm-blooded, which allows for much more energy and speed. 
the classification of dinosaurs and birds in the same family of species was also a breakthrough made possible by the approaching clades and later confirmed by the analysis of collagen found in dinosaur remains. The structure of collagen varies depending on the DNA of the species. In this case, it appears that the collagen found on a dinosaur from the Cretaceous was very similar to the collagen that ostriches or chickens generate. Returning to the appearance of dinosaurs, the truth is we don't know exactly what they look like. We probably have a good understanding of the shape of some of the larger species based on the detailed study of their skeletons. We can determine how their weight was balanced and how they moved. We can also imagine how they fought or hunted. However, we have very little idea about their color. Perhaps they were green or greenish, as generally depicted. But some of them could have been very colorful if this particular feature provided an advantage in evolution. Maybe our vision will be very different in ten years' time, because the science of dinosaurs keeps evolving. New species are named, and new discoveries are made regularly. What we know is that no non-avian dinosaur survived the end of the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous brutally ended 66 million years ago in another mass extinction that eliminated about three-fourths of all planet and animal species on Earth. Non-avian dinosaurs did not make it after the reign of about 150 million years. As far as we know, no tetrapod, an animal with four limbs, which includes humans, weighing more than 50 pounds survived this extinction. Of course, no large dinosaur qualified. The cause of this mass extinction is more widely accepted than previous extinctions. In the geologic record, there is a thin layer of sediment that can be found throughout the world. Corresponding to 66 million years ago, which contains a high level of iridium. Iridium is a very rare element in the Earth's crust, but relatively abundant in asteroids and comets. Therefore, it is believed that a massive asteroid or comet, about six to nine miles wide, fell on Earth and devastated the global environment. It is not solely due to the shock wave that may have played a part, but not enough to destroy ecosystems around the entire planet. The impact winter probably contributed more significantly to the devastation. All the dust propelled into the atmosphere would have plunged the planet into darkness, stopped photosynthesis in plants and plankton, and affected the entire food chain. Larger organisms were at risk of disappearing in such a scenario, and they did. The supposed site where the asteroid fell is located in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula and it is a 110-mile-wide crater. Maybe other factors than the asteroid contributed to the extinction, but in any case, non-avian dinosaurs disappeared, as did many species of mammals, pterosaurus, birds, insects, and plants. As in previous extinctions, life survived. This one and immediately started to radiate again after the event, with new species occupying ecological niches left empty. The one supergroup that diversified a lot during the new period, the Paleocene, is mammals. 
new forms such as horses, whales, primates, or bats appeared after this extinction. The one branch of dinosaurs that made it through the extinction was birds, as I said earlier. It had started to appear long before the end of the Cretaceous. The oldest fossils that point to a transition are from the end of the Jurassic, 150 million years ago. The most famous organism showing the transition is called Archaeopteryx. It was discovered in Germany just two years after the publication of Darwin's most famous work titled On the Origin of Species. This book presented main principles, the foundations of his theory of evolution. At the time, it was seen as proof, a confirmation of evolution, the discovery of Archaeopteryx. Even though it would be a shortcut to call Archaeopteryx, the ancestor of modern birds, or the missing link between dinosaurs and birds. It is also considered today to share a common ancestor with birds, but it is not the ancestor itself. Archaeopteryx was the size of a raven, which was a relatively small dinosaur. It had feathers and it is believed that it could fly, or at least glide. It also retained many characteristics of non-avian dinosaurs. It had teeth, and a long tail that has completely receded in modern birds. It is a testimony of the appearance of feathers at some point during the Jurassic. It is called a transitional fossil. It shows a link between non-avian dinosaurs that appeared first and birds. So birds are the only branch of the dinosaur clade that survived and even thrived after the Cretaceous. In fact, in South America, the apex predator during almost the entire Holocene was a bird. But not a cute bird. From 62 to 2 million years ago, there was a big, carnivorous, and flightless group of birds called Forishrosidae, also known as terror birds. They stood at heights ranging from 3 to 10 feet and possessed powerful necks and beaks. It is unclear what size of prey they hunted, but for millions of years after non-avian dinosaurs disappeared, it was still a dinosaur, but a bird at the same time, that dominated the land food chain in this part of the world. From the moment dinosaurs were discovered in the 19th century, and paleontologists began to investigate them, the public was hooked by these giant creatures, and rightly so. Not just because of the size of some of them and the records they established, but for their adaptability, their variety, and the time they spent dominating the land on Earth. They did so for about 150 million years. They had millions of generations. They survived mass extinctions and climate change. The face of the Earth changed dramatically due to the continent drift during their reign. We, modern humans, now dominate our ecosystems. But this has been true for only a few thousand years. Maybe tens of thousands of years. But this is nothing compared to dinosaurs. It is just a heartbeat. So, this is all for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to dinosaurs, and I invite you to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep, or you can pick another story from my library.
and until we meet again. Good night. Sleep well. <laughs>